so this is a really interesting article that uh, I read in the publication Quillette um, by an assistant professor in the Department of Meteorology and Climate Science at San Jose State University. The author's name is Patrick Brown, and the title is Empiricism and Dogma, Why Left and Right Can't Agree on Climate Change. And when I saw that title, I approached it with trepidation because usually these things trying to analyze why people reach the conclusions they reach are usually some form of the other side is stupid and evil for not seeing my conclusion. But I, th I think he, he had a really thoughtful analysis. And essentially, he starts out by taking this, this kind of mainstream narrative that, well, look, conservatives are just anti-science and the left is pro-science. And that's why the left understands that climate change is a problem and the right denies it. And he points out that like, even if you accept the IPCC version of uh, climate as that is, you know, what it means to be pro-science, like the, to, to attribute the left's embrace of that as based primarily on reason and love of science, well, you'd have to ignore the fact that liberals are just as likely as conservative, conservatives to deny science on the safety of vaccines and genetically modified foods. And so he says that that kind of explanation, which, you know, that makes you feel very good if you're on the left, that just does not hold up. And so he says, like, so we still have this question, what explains the divide of the left and right? Because on the other hand, you can't just reverse it and go, oh, well, the right really cares about science because set aside your view of climate change, just something like, uh, you know, the intelligent design and whatever. There's all sorts of things where you can clearly say, all right, the right is inconsistent in its view of science. And so what Brown says is, rather than thinking about the political divide on global warming as the result of dogma versus logic, a better explanation is that people tend to embrace conclusions, scientific or otherwise, that support themes, ideologies, and narratives that are pre-existing components of their worldview. So it's, you have a certain view of how politics should work or more broadly, just a certain kind of philosophy or ideology. And then you'll tend to embrace scientific ideas that seem more consistent with that and reject ones that seem less consistent. And so starting in that, he, with that sort of hypothesis, he goes on to examine what are the things about climate science as it's currently, it's understood in the mainstream that attracts the left and that repels the right. And so, for example, he points out that, you know, the, uh, that climate as it's currently thought about lends itself to collectivism, to anti-business conclusions, right? Like, you know, the, the left is very critical of corporations and here it's corporations are ruining the planet. So, you know, that, it, it, that is very appealing to them. It, the collectivism is like, oh, we need authoritarian things that dictate what kind of energy we use and what kind of farming uh, processes and what kind of cars we buy. So it's very attractive on that front to the left, but most perceptive he identifies as quote, the most fundamental issue, humanism versus non-humanism. That's my way of framing it. The way he puts it is those on the right are more likely to privilege the interests of humanity over the interests of other species or the quote interests of the planet as a whole to the degree that there is such a thing. On the other hand, those on the left are more likely to emphasize a kind of pan-species egalitarianism and care for our shared environment, even if it means implementing policies that run counter to human short-term interests. Now, I think I, I agree with that assessment. Um, I do think the, the deeper issue here, at least a deeper issue, is whether the right is anti-science, even on the climate issue, because Brown certainly thinks there are that they are. And I think there's a sense in which he's right. Uh, I don't think in the sense of the people who have really thought about and looked into this issue, such as the ones we've interviewed on Power Hour, I don't think you can paint them as, well, they're just reasoning backwards from their politics. I mean, the, the politics of so-called climate skeptics, in my experience, is quite eclectic and runs across the ideolo ideological spectrum. Um, but I do think that if you just think of conservatives broadly as a group, that it's very common to reason backwards from politics in the same way that Brown suggests. And so one of the consequences of that, or one of the signs of that is that if they, um, 
don't just deny the kind of exaggerated or unjustified portions of mainstream climate science, um, but they reject even very well established things without good reasons, or they embrace, you know, like, oh, I know it's causing climate change and they have whatever their pet theory is that has even less support than the kind of, you know, greenhouse gas uh, hypothesis. Uh, I think those are signals that it's your reasoning backwards from your politics. And that's why I think it, it it's the uh, CIP and on this podcast, we really try to stress that the first thing is just you start out looking at the evidence in an even handed and precise way, rather than just starting from, I know that, you know, this, this physical phenomenon can't be happening because of my politics. Like, no, you really have to examine the evidence. Um, but then the second is that you need to be pro-human. So it's you, you're not committed to some scientific view in order to support your political policies. Rather, it's that you want to choose the policies that are, in fact, best for human life. And so that really requires you to first think about, well, what is the, the actual state of reality that is going to impact human life one way or the other? And then it's selecting policies that will achieve the best outcome for human beings, which, as we've argued, is not going to be the kind of totalitarian policies of the catastrophists. Um, but like, even in a case of major rapid warming is really going to be focused on things that are effective and things that are consistent with prosperity, including affordable energy. So Stefan, that's, that's my thoughts on this article. Yeah, so leaving aside the question whether, quote unquote, the left as a group is pro-science, even on the climate issue, and we've seen like people exaggerate, uh, you know, whenever it fits the narrative with the recent tornado cluster where they claim that this is global warming and so on. But you could see that on both sides that there's a legitimate issue sort of thinking things the other way around, right? So you see some sort of implied result from from politics and then you see oh there's something wrong with that because that's how most people usually come to be skeptics of of something right so a lot of people have probably seen like oh yeah they will take over the the economy with central planning and then they are offering something like a non-solution like a so 100 solar and wind power grid and then there's something wrong with that and, and people investigate and you know, see more of that. But of course, if we want to make sound decisions, we obviously need to analyze more carefully, like what is the issue? What is the real threat? Uh, how to think about these issues and so on. But you can see sort of the same fallacies on both sides, but they end up aligning with different politics. I, I think in this case, Brown is right in arguing that sort of this is going on to some extent. But I, I, I think it's not totally illegitimate to, you know, question the political implications and then seeing what's behind it. Because, you know, with every given issue, we are not experts on everything and we have to, you know, spend our time on specific issues. Now, climate is on both sides seen as a big issue, on the right more like a threat to freedom or on the on the right side is probably a, a bad category to begin with, but it's definitely uh, something where you have to carefully investigate and not just uh, th sort of align with with the right people as happens in about every field. I think. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And so, like, I definitely think what you could say, like, if you were just a layman and you had not heard anything about this, and you know, you were suddenly dropped into North America and started hearing the calls for the Green New Deal. Um, I definitely think you could say, whoa, there, there's something really wrong with this view of what they're saying is that we're going to achieve prosperity and opportunity through a totalitarian takeover of the economy and specifically the energy economy. And then you could think like whatever is true of the science, like that cannot be right. So I definitely think like it's not that you have to be completely agnostic on these things, but what what I don't think you could do is leap to the conclusion about what must be true about the climate from what you know is true from a wider context of knowledge about uh, the kind of 
economics and policies that allow human beings to flourish. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely don't want to say that anybody who has not become, you know, climate science level expert has to basically be agnostic on something like, you know, the Green New Deal or, you know, carbon tax.